Hello, we are going to be starting in one minute. So we're just waiting for more people to join. Um, if you, someone could confirm in the chat that we you can hear me, that would be great. So just to make sure that sound is right. Cool, thank you. So let's wait for one minute and we're going to get started. Hi, David. Long time no see. Well, let's get started. So hello, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, there is people from all over the world, and we are really excited to bring you an awesome speaker today. We are running a series of webinars on the topic of product discovery. And we start today by looking at product discovery from the, the lens of a UX designer and user researcher. Let me first get started with a brief round of introductions. So my name is Gerard Chiva, and I am the managing director and co-founder of Active Solutions, a management consulting firm from Barcelona. And today we have with us Oliver Jan. Oliver has been working in UX and UI design for over 12 years and can draw from experience on projects in industries such as insurance, healthcare, education, mobility, digital farming, nonprofit, and shared economy. He will be providing a lot of useful tips and practical advice to benefit from rapid prototyping as a key component of product discovery. Our, our company, Active Solutions, uh, what we do is we help digital businesses lead their market with our innovation digital product and lean programs. For those who don't know our company, we started operating on September 2018. And since then, and since the very beginning, we have been providing free high quality content online, ebooks, hundreds of blog posts, video trainings, video interviews, and webinars. So we didn't start doing webinars two months ago, like most of the companies in the world did. We have been doing that for a while. And as a, an introduction to product discovery for maybe for those of you hearing this word for first time, I will define it as a as the continuous process of learning and validating what to build. It is essentially characterized by discovering what the market is, what problems customers have, coming up with ideas for solutions and quickly validating them with rapid prototyping. And this last part, about rapid prototyping is what Oliver is going to be talking about today. Just some this notice before we jump into the content. Uh, as I was saying, we are running a series of webinars on the on product discovery. This today is the first one with the goal of providing an holistic overview of product discovery, which we believe is a cornerstone of modern product teams, as well as a huge competitive advantage. So here you have the list. You can go to the to the link below and you can register to any of them. And the webinar today is how to bring prototyping into a lean process. And there is going to be time for Q&A at the end. So please, if you have any questions, write them in the chat. And at the end, I will go through the questions, OK? So, Oliver, it's all yours. And okay. let's see. Um, thank you very much, Jira. First of all, thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak a little bit about. Um, 
about uh, prototyping. Um, I think, can we see? Let me let me try to start the presentation for you. Okay, yeah. there it there is. okay. yes. So thank you, thank you uh, very much for giving me the opportunity for to 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 speak a little bit about uh, lean prototyping. And um, yes, so I titled um, I titled the presentation to visualize and validate because I think that's the most important uh, goals and purposes of prototyping. We will go into into a little bit deeper into into the purposes and how to to implement them and how to get them into a um, lean process of prototyping and product discovery. So. So the webinar goals a little bit we have been sort of alluded just uh, one minute ago by by myself. So what I would like to 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 hand over to you is a understanding of what what uh, prototyping is, what lean prototyping might uh, might distinguish it from 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 prototyping, and what uh, what purpose it it serves, and uh, what types of fidelity exist to prototyping and when to use them and how these types of fidelity can be implemented and which tools should be used to do so. So just first uh, a first step I would to 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 just very briefly speak about the, the lean startup process which I assume that that uh, that you already know that. So the lean startup process um, consists of a cycle of building something, measuring the its performance, and learning from um, from the insights that you get from stakeholders, uh, your user, uh, customer group, and so on, and then iterating um, the prototype that you build and and generate further data from this. So it's an ongoing cycle. We will come to that later. And um, so the general goals of prototyping, what actually prototyping is, is that um, prototyping is an unfinished version of the product. That's um, something that you build before your idea or the, the product that you intend to build goes into production or development, or however you want to, to name that. Um, the purpose of prototyping is to visualize and communicate your ideas. So if you have an idea of, of a product to be built, then the, the purpose of the prototype is a visualization of this idea and uh, to communicate this towards your stakeholders, your team or your customers for, 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 for feedback and things like that. And um, it does so by simulating um, a, a process of interaction that should be dynamic and um, to give uh, to give a, an opportunity to 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 the testy um, to say okay well I, I will I will press this or that button and then um, a, a, a suitable uh, response should come from the prototype and then generate learnings on how the uh, the testy um, understands or accepts the, the, the product that is uh, part of the prototype. So a, a prototype should always display um, a closed end-to-end -end use case. So it should not stop or begin with a uh, within a use case, but it should begin, for example, with the registration or the login and then go over to, to um, to the actual use case, so that is it's easier for the testy to uh, to immerse him or herself in into the situation that the prototype simulates. Um, I've also come to learn that um, I do not use any longer uh, uh, like like placeholder contact within my prototypes, but I try to use. Um, real content or representative content as early as possible and um yeah well all over the prototypes if it is possible if i have suitable content and hand so because um otherwise people actually ask questions oh well why do i have this or that where 
what should what should be written over there why is there latin content is always also a question that comes comes uh, to ask and then you're sort of you you're not within the, the the testing process because you have to explain why there is placeholder content or or blind text or blind copy and so on and the most important thing to prototyping is that it is always connected to some sort of validation in most cases this would be testing and we will go through uh, several steps and several methods of testing that are um, connected and related to several types of fidelity of prototyping in the, in the next slides. So, and because before we do this, um, I would like to point out to several, uh, like three phases of product design um, that are very, uh, very important to, to differ certain types of fidelity within the prototyping process. So the first step is um, service design and service design is uh, more or less the, um, the phase of, of product design that is related to, to, to uh, deep insights of um, user research, um, basic ideations for, for, for service development, um, a standard standard tool that would be used in such in such a, uh, a process step would be design thinking or, or other other uh, tools for ideation. So the next step is um, uh, interaction design, and when the service design um, develops uh, an idea what the actual uh, what the actual service should be about, what what purpose it should serve, then the interaction phase is more about how should how should this work so and this is more like classical ux um information architecture interaction processes are def defined in such a such a phase and then the last phase is visual design and this is more about the look and feel about uh, the interface and also about the content and more about aesthetics and uh, yeah actually the look and feel so and when we go over to um, what kind of prototypes um, and fidelity, what level of fidelity should be implemented in these phases, we can draw a graph like, and the x axis, uh, x -axis over here um, represents the, the, the progress over time within your product discovery. And the y axis represents the fidelity of the prototype. So the higher, um, the element will be on, the, on the, uh, this axis, on the uh, y-axis, then uh, the the higher the your fidelity would be. So if we go over to the prototyping in the first phase, that would be a low, so-called low fidelity prototype in um, the service design phase. So what uh, what is a low-fi pro, uh, proto low-fi prototype? So a low-fi prototype consists of sketches and a so-called paper prototyping so that you would have um, drawings and sketches um, from several steps of the interaction process and um, guide people through these um, these drawings that change for example from step by step or you use some kind of um, some kind of uh, post-its for example to simulate um, a pop-up for example and things like that um, so what benefits do these uh, do paper prototyping and lo-fi prototyping have? So the main benefit is that it's highly collaborative and everyone can participate because there is no ex expertise needed for design tools and things like that. Everyone can draw a rectangle or um, a circle or a triangle. So it's highly um, inclusive to people from other teams. Who have different expertises, and it's it's very easy to to uh, to create something that um, everyone can contribute to. It's very fast and has low costs, so um, it enables you to to validate um, ideas that are fundamentally different, and um, to validate how how well they would be accepted by the customer group and how desirable your idea is, actually is. So going over to the next step, if we would assume 
that we, you um, have validated your low fidelity prototype and you have created something that is acceptable and desirable to the customer group, then you would go over to a mid fidelity prototype uh, during the interaction design phase. So, and you can see that there is more more time uh, in the process. Uh, in the uh, in this step is is is. Uh, is used to uh, develop the interaction, uh, the, the mid fidelity prototype. So the first step, uh, the first phase in of service design is shorter than the, the the next phase, and so it goes on. So mid fidelity prototypes um, are connected to to um, to wireframes and and uh, yeah blueprint de designs that have, uh, I assume. Every one of us knows, like with these grayish boxes and uh, um, placeholder uh, images for 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 uh, graphic content and things like that. And this enables you to um, create a clickable, actually clickable wireframes, and to focus on on the design of information and the structure of the interface and how to design the process of interaction for your tool. And it enables you to to um, postpone the design of aesthetics and visual language to a later point, and to focus actually on these uh, structural and mechanic uh, elements of your product. Um, one thing is that uh, uh, designing a mid fidelity prototype requires proficiency on certain prototyping tools and design tools, and it's. On the where the first the, the the paper prototyping was ideally to to uh, to validate desirability, um, the mid fidelity prototype is uh, generally used to uh, validate usability. For example, with stakeholders, other UX experts, or even users um, to validate uh, uh, within a usability testing. So. You might say, okay, I have, um, I have, I've, I've encountered problems with users understanding that this is not a final layout, and that people say, oh, well, well, I like the interaction, but uh, the aesthetics are quite, quite, uh, well, I would expect more. Do not like it. Then this is, this might lead to, to, to problems of, 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 of uh, the validity of, of the feedback that you get from users. But nevertheless, this is a quite very, very uh, excellent uh, tool to have to gather feedback from stakeholders as well as experts from fields of UX and design, from people who understand the purpose of, of these, um, these clickable wireframes. So the last phase, as mentioned, visual design incorporates um, a so-called high fidelity prototype. And you can see that this phase is even longer than the last one and goes to several iterations of, of the high fidelity prototype. And as you can see over here, that the layout of uh, the mid fidelity prototype has been used after validation and uh, scaled up to a more realistic layout and a more like a visual mock-up with a realistic look. Um, the high fidelity prototype is clickable as well, just like uh, as the mid fidelity prototype, and it's actually actually the the closest version to a realistic product that we can get from this model. Um, as the last, the mid fidelity prototype was um, focused on on um, on the usability and the interaction design. Um, the, the high fidelity prototype um, focuses on the design of the visual language, consistency of the visual language, and also its tonality for the for for the image content and so on. Um, the best way, and we'll come to that later, to create a high fidelity prototype is to upgrade the mid fidelity prototype file, so that you do not have to to rebuild something, but you would use the structure and um, the setup of your mid fidelity prototype file, for example, in Sketch, to upgrade this one to a high fidelity prototype. So by just by saving time, this is a very, very important um, attribute to lean prototyping to use your, your design files as sustainably as possible. And um, coming from valid validating uh, the, um, the usability, um, in the mid-fidelity prototype, the high-fidelity prototype is best way used to validate enjoyability. The visual uh, 
a piece of um, of uh, the the product and the visual understanding with users. So, is the is do do people understand the consistency of your layout? Is it well, uh, is it well designed from a from a, a, a point of use of color, typography, uh, form and function? Is it consistent and so on? So, if we're going over to to um, a let's say a more traditional um, setup of creating your your UX and UI designs, um, you uh, yeah you would um, let's say go to a a process that that incorporates the creation of a high fidelity prototype without any testing. So this is something like um, yeah big bang projects uh, and and things like waterfall projects that are not very uh, user centric and not very iterative so but what can happen if you imp start with the implement implementation of a high fidelity prototype you skip the uh, the validation of the acceptance you do not know if you're creating a a, a, a desirable product and you do not know if you, the structure that you set up is uh, and the usability um, is suitable to your customer group. So what can happen um, if you launch this to the market or you, you finish with the testing, then it might occur that you, your actual prototype fails and you you see that it's not very under, it's not uh, it's not accepted and it's not very usable to your customer group. So what you actually do over there is that you burn a lot of money and how to avoid this, is that you use uh, a, um, a subsequent uh, yeah, ladder of fidelity that you start with low fidelity pr prototypes um, to validate uh, the desirability and uh, the general approach of your idea with like uh, fundamentally different uh, uh, concepts for, for, for the interface, or for example, and then select the one that is, uh, that is accepted the most and continue this one to the mid fidelity prototype to validate your usability and then um, going over to validating the enjoyability and visual acceptance of your high fidelity prototype so that you have actually something very, very secure and very something very reliable. So to speak in a, in a visual analogy, you would say this, this is like climbing a, a, a wall um, that you secure yourself to the wall step by step so that you do not climb it all at once, but you make sure if you fall, you do not fall too deep. So you can, you can you have a fallback if you would say, okay, the last version that we designed was not accepted very well. Maybe the uh, usability was not as, as thought and um, as, as you would like to have it from your customer group, then you would have the last version of, of your mid fidelity prototype or your low fidelity prototype to fall back so that you at least know that um, the, the general approach and the idea of your product is accepted so that you, you, you actually know, okay, you can start from this last step again. And to um, to get back to uh, this cycle of building, measuring, and learning uh, about your product, um, you would say that you start over with um, your low fidelity prototype, validating the acceptance and the desirability of your product idea, and then go over to, to scaling this up to a mid fidelity prototype, validating the and and iterating on uh, the usability and structure of your pro, uh, of your prototype and then going over scaling it up to um to a high fidelity prototype and validating this again with uh, testing and feedback from your user group so going over to um to the tools that you actually would need to create these prototypes um are let's say Creating low fidelity prototypes or paper prototypes is actually the tooling that you would need is everything that that actually is used in, in uh, art lessons at primary school. So 
Um, scissors and black and colored markers and papers and post-its are quite important, but you can also going go over to 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 more like gluing something and and uh, being more creative with these kind of things, and also use, uh, using uh, a so-called pop app um, that allows you to make uh, photos from your drawings and your sketches and uh, link them to into a clickable interactive prototype. Um, I have uh, already spoken about um, about the the sustainability of your tooling within the mid fidelity and high fidelity uh, prototyping. So I will suggest that uh, I will suggest you uh, tools that are that you can use for both steps. And uh, I would strongly recommend that you use one tool for both steps so th that you do not need to rebuild and uh, waste time on the creation of a high fidelity prototype, but uh, stay within one file or copy this file for, for, for the next version of the prototype and then use the existing structure to, to upgrade your prototype. So the um the selection of uh the tools over here uh, was taken from from um the ux tools survey um and actually the four tools that i will pre will present to you are the most popular um tools for, for prototyping um from this survey that was taken from ux designers from all over the world so the first um environment for for prototyping is actually the one that i use as well um, is uh, is sketch prototype uh, sketch um, the sketch app and Envision prototyping connected with the craft plugin from Envision. So sketch has the the main benefit that it is a um, uh, yeah a seasoned uh, industry standard with a really great usability and it's uh, easy easy to learn and easy to to uh, to get into the tool. And that there are many, many templates and plugins, plugins for Sketch um, that you can use to extend the features and the functionality of uh, the design software, and as well as many templates that can be used as a foundation or a basis for your further design process, such as um, uh, the At Atomic Sketch a template that I created uh, and this free for download. We'll come to that later, and that enables you to uh, to take um, elements, UI elements from a pre-existing um, uh, UI component library. Another benefit to, ske to, to Sketch and Envision is that it uh, the linking to, to uh, other products of Envision, like uh, Inspect, handing over to uh, handing over design files to developers, for example, is very easy. As well as uh, the Design System Manager that enables you to create an overview of the components that you have within your designs. Also. If you might work in a corporate environment um, that is very restrictive on a on let's say the uh, the use of websites, for example, and uh, things like that, then you might prefer to have a downloadable prototype, which Envision allows, and then you can sort of uh, test your designs on a, a local hard drive. Um, it might also be said Sketch is only available for macOS and is about $99, um, $99 uh, per year. Um, by this version, you you uh, you are allowed to use um, to use the last version of Sketch that you download or updated at the end of your 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 payment uh, year um, forever. So there is no there is no 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 stopping of the use after after uh, your um, payment year uh, stops. So another quite um, recent upstarter for, into the uh, landscape of prototyping tools is Figma. And um, Figma is free to use, which uh, differs them a little bit from, from Sketch, for example, and is known for its very quite mighty and great uh, Team collaboration between different uh, between different contributors from design teams and so on, and um, it is a cloud-based uh, tool that can be used from a web app, but as well as from a desktop app. So the usage of the usage of the web app um, makes it 
um, agnostic from any specific uh, operating system. So you can use it from a, a Mac OS uh, uh, device, but as well as from a uh, Windows device. Also, um, Figma is a all-in-one tool. So it allows you to the actual UI design, but as well as the, the prototyping and linking, linking just with them within one tool. It might also be said that prototypes are only available um, in, in the online version. It's not, uh, it's not possible to download the prototypes to a um, offline availability. Um, it, it should also be said that there are native features for sharing design systems, which uh, is um, just is, it's sort of within, within the tool and not like uh, in the environment of uh, Sketch and InVision that uh, it's, it's separated. So another, just a couple of years ago, Adobe um, started to develop its own uh, prototyping tool and stopped to 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 um use photoshop as a ui design tool which is a quite uh, brilliant idea because photoshop is a tool that is you that is intended to for for image manipulation and not for prototyping and ui design so ux uh, ux design by adobe xd uh, is a quite specific tool only for for ui design and prototyping it's also free, free available, available, and you can use it with a, um, a creative, account, a creative cloud account. There are both versions for Mac OS and Windows, and just like Figma, it's a all-in-one tool. As said, it's part of the creative cloud, so the uh, the communication between um, Illustrator and Photoshop um, uh, work quite well, and. Um, there is also one special uh, speech, a special feature within it is that there is the the possibility to prototype for voice commands so if you want to create for example something like um like uh, the uh, voice command interaction with with siri or um google uh, voice control then this might be it might be a good tool to implement um a prototype for these kind of features and the last, uh, the last tool uh, for prototyping is uh, is something special. It's a front end framework. So this is more about if you uh, have skills or someone in your team with skills in, in 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 coding and front end development, but as well UI design, then um, using a front end framework could be a, a could be a smart idea to uh, get more flexibility. Uh, in, into your uh, into your prototyping, because you would use actual HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to set up a prototype. Um, example for these frameworks are, for example, Bootstrap from Twitter, um, Foundation, but as well as UI Kit, which is the screen that you can see over here. And the, those uh, those frameworks offer a large library of UI components that can be used and, and called with classes and uh, implemented into a, a HTML markup and so on. It, it has to be said that this is more time consuming, but it's also more flexible um, because you are able to use actual data. You can draw data from the web and you can you can set up your own logic, your own calculations, and so on, and um, actually go beyond the the limitations of of just uh, only um, digital prototyping with tools like Sketch and or Figma or uh, Adobe XD, and use just the broad um, the broad spectrum of the possibilities that uh, actual development offers. It is also highly sustainable and can be reused by the developers in the further process. So again, that you um, save time within your product discovery by uh, reusing stuff that has been has been already has already been created, and uh, that developers do not have to set up all the markup, all the structure again, because the, the last version would be done in a digital prototyping tool. And the actual next version of the, uh, of the product would have to be done uh, with code so that you can just hand over snippets of code to the developers and they save time because they 
for example, would have to code only the half of the work. Um, of course, this requires proficiency in, in, in coding, knowledge about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, but the usage of these frameworks um, makes it quite, quite convenient that not everything has to be coded um, coded by the designer or the developer themselves, because everything, well, let's say a, a structure and a library of components uh, was already set up. So to summarize, um, again, we talked about prototyping as it is a simulation of a product or service, and its purpose is to validate the assumptions that you have or your team have um, about your product idea, about um, the structure of your interaction design and uh, the the choices that you did on your aesthetics, on your visual language, and so on, and to generate learnings about your 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 stakeholders and uh, as well as your customers and their acceptance or to to um, the the assumptions that you did, and of course to use these learnings to iterate um, from a low fidelity prototype towards a mid-fidelity prototype, towards a high-fidelity prototype. So going through the steps of validating the desirability of your service, the usability of your structure, and the enjoyability of the visual choices that you did. Best tools for this, as mentioned, would be um, pen and paper for uh, low-fidelity prototypes, Sketch and InVision, Figma, Adobe XD or front-end frameworks for mid-fidelity or high-fidelity prototyping, or let's say mid-fidelity and high-fidelity prototyping. So um, I also created a list of further reads if you're interested into uh, further literature um, and uh, further information about the, the subject of prototyping. <clears throat> of course, there is uh, the Lean Startup from Eric Ries, but I also recommend these uh, the the uh, videos from um, uh, from Google for Startups about um, uh, paper prototyping, digital prototyping, and native prototyping, and as well as uh, the uh, the book Lean UX by Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden. It's also quite uh, uh, quite insightful about lean processes to implement them into you, your UX design process. Also, I <clears throat> I invite you to to check about um, the Atomic Sketch uh, template that I created uh, for Sketch. You can read the article under this link, and there is also a download link for uh, the free usage of uh, the Sketch file that you can use to set up your next project. So, thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure, and I hope I hope I could give you um, insight into to my way of prototyping and my way how to set up and support people in the product uh, discovery process. And I would uh, I would be glad to answer your questions if you have um, any any uh, questions on deeper insights or um, yeah further information that was not given during the presentation. Cool. Thank you very much. Very interesting, Oliver. And we have some questions already. In just in case uh, anybody has a question, you you can just drop it in the chat, and we will go for it. Well, first one is asking. Uh, Fioral is asking, can Figma be used offline? So, to my experiences, uh, Figma um, can. I think yeah, for prototyping, it can be used um, uh, can be used offline, but it cannot be uh, it cannot be used to download an offline available prototype. So if you, as I said, if you if you're working in a very restrictive uh, environment, that might generate a problem. But as I said, each, uh, there is, to my understanding, there is no. Um, there is no winner in these in, in this battle of prototyping tools. It just depends on your individual needs. So if you if you're going out for for a, a high level of team collaboration and a very, very transparent uh, design process towards your product owner or um, or the client that you're working with, then uh, then Figma would be the ideal tool to work with because it allows everyone to, to, to watch into the existing uh, ongoing design process at any time. Great, next question. Well, uh, next question is three questions. So 
Um, Carolina is asking, how long does it take to get from low to high fi fidelity prototypes? And also, is this process sh shared with engineers or is it set apart? And last question of uh, when do they start working on the development of the of the tested feature? So the first question was, how long does it take from low, so the complete process? Um, that uh, that, de that actually uh, depends on the amount of budget that you put in into these, these several processes. From time to time, uh, the service design might take up a month or even, even longer. Um, it has to be said, low fidelity prototyping is only a part of, of, of uh, service design. So that you might might say, okay, the, the, um, the uh, creation of the low fidelity prototype might take a day and then a day of guerrilla testing on the street. And um, then again, uh, an iteration, so on, might take a week, but there are also teams that, that use uh, the time of a month to, to really uh, set up a very, very resilient and uh, very validated product idea. And um, I would say for, a, for, for an MVP feature set, the, the last of, um, the last two steps might take um, one month to three months. That just depends on, on, on the level of, uh, of uh, budget and resources that you put into that. So the second question was also the process is, so is this process shared with engineers or is it set apart? Um, so, Jeff Gothelf in the in the mentioned book Lean UX uh, recommends to to involve um, developers as early as possible to create um, common sketches during a um, a method that he calls a design studio. And uh, actually, I've tried it myself, and it, it's uh, very very uh, insightful to to the whole team. And everyone is is given the opportunity to contribute to, to the idea and to say, for example, this is implementable, this is feasible, um, this might take too long, and this might uh, might be feasible during the, 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 the time that we have uh, the, the time constraints that are set up to our project. So I would say implement it to, to uh, involve the development team as early as possible. Um, if you have the opportunity to do so already by one or two contributors in your service design team. Yeah, I will add something at the end of this round of questions because I have something <laughs> to say about that. And the last question of this set of questions was, when do they start working on the development of this tested feature? I'm assuming when the engineers start working on this, on this validated uh, feature. Yeah, so um, that that goes back to 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 um, Jeff Gothelf uh, with, uh, with Design Studio. So the idea behind Design Studio is not that not only that everyone is allowed to 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 give feedback to uh, the product idea, but also that everyone is allowed to to or enabled to work uh, at the same time. So that you create a common sketch, a common common interface idea within a, a workshop of two and a half hours that is already has already already been iterated within the, the, the product team consisting of designers and backend developers and front end developers and the product management or ownership and so on. And um, after the creation of this, this common sketch, interface sketch, um, everyone says okay this this is manageable this is feasible um i can i can contribute to this i can work on this um in in the next sprint for example um the team leaves the workshop and everyone starts to work on the on on the field of his or her expertise like for example the, the ux designer would use the sketches to create a mid fidelity uh, prototype and to validate this in a in a in some kind of uh, validation uh, method, um, usability testing, for example. While in the meantime, the um, the, the backend development is uh, is enabled to to set up the logic and to code the logic, 
while the front end development uh, is uh, is able to to work on the markup and maybe setting up uh, a CSS uh, a CSS structure um, or selecting a certain a certain uh, front end framework and so on, so that there is no dead time, so that everyone is uh, is is able to to work simult simultaneously and that there is no situation um, like development has to work for the result, has to wait for the results from um, from uh, UX design and actually is on that time and then for a week or two weeks or three weeks, but um, that you enable the team to work simultaneously and to, to come back, for example, after three or five days of work and to compare the results of the learning um, and then to arrange uh, uh, the state of work so that everyone can return to um, to his expertise again. And so it continues. So here, I just wanted to, so we didn't speak at all about the, the whole whole concept or the whole process of product discovery, but um, uh, be remind that we are not, we don't necessarily have to be validating the whole product here. We may, we, we try to focus on a problem to be solved for a specific type of customer. And then for this, we may do a, a prototype and validate them with them. This doesn't have to be the whole product because we are not yet building. We are we are reducing the uncertainty with, with regards to our riskiest assumptions. Some of them will be viability of, of the business model. Some others will be desirability, like Oliver was saying or usability. Those are where prototyping is helping the most, but you, you don't have to be a, a full a kind of full fresh prototype. You validate what is your, your most, uh, your biggest concern at the time, and then you go to the next one. Yeah. And also engineers should participate. I mean, for me, I, I tend to think on product teams and for me, product teams are made of UXers, designers, um, data scientists, uh, product owners or product managers, um, engineers, and then um, so engineers most of spend most of the time in building stuff, and researchers and designers spend most of the time researching and building prototypes, right? The, but as much as you can, that's so that's the whole team responsibility. So you will have an ideation workshop where everybody can participate. You will have, uh, I don't know, um, um, a design studio workshop where hopefully everybody will be able to participate. You will have reviews with customers, which is always good to bring the different perspectives into the room to see what are the, the how is the conversation with the customer going in a usability testing. So um, this is everybody's responsibility. The, the thing is that some teams will be much more focused on the research and design part and some parts of the team will be much more focused on the build part but this is team right that's what i wanted to say about this and there's another question uh, fear out do you apply researches between phases of prototyping excuse me do you apply researches between phases of prototyping so i'm assuming that he is asking if when validating or building a prototype, you kind of go back again to do some research. So that in, in between. That, yeah. So of course, um, that was uh, if you remember um, the graph that I showed, there was always steps of, of, of testing. Well, or let's say let's call it more general more, in more general uh, terms, um, validation and uh, how you implement this into your process might depend on the amount of resources that you have at hand. So, um, of course, I I point out that there is always the need of to of, to do research with the prototype. So it's that you create the creation of a prototype without having a validation is um, let's call it suboptimal, and it's not it's not what it. it, it it was intended to 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 deliver. It should create um, insights about your your customer group, about your stakeholders, and so on. Um, most important, your customers. And um, but how this should be implemented in in, in, in on a uh, on a 
team scale might depend on the amount of uh, budget that you that you have at hand. So if you a really small startup, you might uh, bring in someone who is able to create the prototype as well as do the research. Um, if you have a larger team, then um, you might actually have a specific role for creating the prototype like UX UI design and then a separate role for, for doing the research, which I would recommend because as a designer, as the creator of the prototype, you can be um, as professional as you, you try, as you, as you intend, as you like, but you're at the end, you're a human being and you're always um, involved, em emotionally involved into the creation prototype because you are the creator. And um, if you work as uh, uh, the person to validate this product, uh, this, this prototype and the assumptions that you made over there, you're always biased. And so I would recommend if you have the, the possibility to hire a freelance researcher, for example, or to have someone um, who has experience on, 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 on doing research, have her or him do the validation of your prototype because he or she has a fresh sight on the, the, the customer group, on the prototype that you did, and in general has a, a, a more objective um, perspective on, on doing the research as you would ever have. But in some cases, this is not possible budget-wise. And then it's, it's, still, it's still best to do the research by yourself as no research. Cool. Thank you very much. There are no more questions. So um, we're going to end the webinar here. First of before leaving, just um, informing all the uh, attendees that um, you're going to get an email tomorrow with the link to the replay. If you, if you want to revisit this webinar or you want to share in your network or with your friends or colleagues at work, just do it. And remember, there are also three more webinars coming, one with a product manager, the other one with an engineer, and the last one with me. So we will have four different perspectives about product discovery, the researcher and designer, the product manager, the engineer and the consultant. So hopefully, overall, you will get uh, a taste of what this product discovery thing is about. Um, thank you very much, Oliver, for uh, your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining and see you in upcoming webinars. Bye bye. Bye bye.